Good afternoon, everyone. This is the Oracle coming in for a not so normal commentary. If this is your first time ever coming across my, my channel, you will see that all of my videos have been centered around what it is been like for me being an ex-Jehovah Witness. I've used my background as a highly educated professional African-American female as a base to be able to go back in time and talk about the process of growing up as an African-American and coming into my own. However, because of a conversation I had this morning with my husband, who is a highly awarded educator and someone who has done fellowships on the African-American experience, as well as myself, who has published articles and have done research on the African-American experience, I thought it would be different to do something a little bit outside of what I normally do, which is talk about being an ex Jehovah Witness. If you go back maybe two videos ago, I actually did almost a three hour presentation on the experiences of African Americans in the United States. Um, a lot of the research that I quoted was based on things that my husband had helped me compile. I also have a citations page. And I really enjoyed doing something a little bit different. I also correlated it with being an African American in the Jehovah Witness organization. What I wanted to do was set up a societal background and then correlate it to uh, my growth and my growing up as a Jehovah Witness and actually leaving that particular religion slash cult. But what I want to talk about today is really, it doesn't really have anything to do with being an African American uh, in the Jehovah Witness organization, but it does have to do with being an African American in the United States of America. And so if you're one of my followers that likes to listen to commentary about an ex Jehovah Witness, I just kind of want to let you know that that's really not going to be what this particular video log is about. This is about a conversation my, my husband and I had. And if you see the title, it's my reaction to uh, Chelsea Handler's white privilege, which was something that my husband was watching this morning because he is an educator. He's also, uh, he's in a few quote unquote secret societies, but he's in, uh, he's also in, uh, he's in his alumni fraternity chapter. He's a regional officer of education and he's really interested in things that have to do with race. And I refuse to watch <laughs> this video and I'm going to, I'm going to say why in a, in a few. But I was really shocked to see him watching the video. So he and I had a, com a, a great conversation. Um, just as an aside, one of the things that I think help keeps relationships fresh is always having great communication. And that's something that from the moment that I, I met my husband, um, we were just dating that we had these great, long, wonderful conversations about everything under the sun. So we love to debate and talk about things. And I, I love listening to him because he's brilliant. And um, I love that he's educating people and that he, even in his spare time, he joins groups and associations that have to do with education of all people. So <laughs> I walked into uh, the dining area and he had this this Netflix special on where Chelsea Handler was talking about being a white Jewish woman 
and being surprised by all of her white privilege and wanting to do a Netflix special on it. <clears throat> and I was, <laughs> I've been hearing about it because um, I don't, I'm not a big fan of Jada Pink, Pinkett Smith, but I came across a blurb about her inter interviewing Chelsea Handler about her Netflix special on white privilege and how Jana Pickett and her mother were like, all these white people need to do is have black friends so that they can be more empathetic to the black experience. And if you saw my face, which if you're curious why I don't show my face, please go to my first video. If you've never come across my videos before, <laughs> Uh, if you could see the sarcasm on my face when I'm telling you about Jada Pickett's, um, Pink, Pinkett Smith's video on Red Table Talk, you would understand why I am like, are you absolutely serious right now? Um, listen, I, I'm, I don't worship celebrities, first of all. Um, and I feel like celebrities are the last people to talk about social commentary that has to do with everyday African American people. Let me say that again. I don't trust celebrities. I don't worship celebrities. And I feel like celebrities are the very last people to talk about what is going on with everyday African-American people. And I'm only talking about my community. Feel free to talk about your community and your background, but I'm talking about my community and my background and why I don't listen to celebrities when they talk about what's going on with the everyday people in my community. That's number one, because <laughs> I don't trust their motivation. I always feel like they have an agenda. It's always for something to make them look good to the rest of society. It's never genuine. Not, I don't want to say never genuine, because Queen Viola Davis, who I always is an auntie in my head, um, <laughs> I trust her. I believe, I believe in her vision. Um, there's a few, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of popping off right now because this is a very relaxed, informal sit around. I, I have, um, you know, I'm doing my hair today. And so I have my hair up in a conditioner, um, which is the luxury of me not showing my face. And I decided while my um, husband went out and picked up my honorary daughter from dance class that I would kind of use this time to have a little social commentary about my reaction as an African-American woman on a celebrity talking about a white Jewish celebrity talking about her uh, white privilege and how she wants to exploit that and make a Netflix video. Um, boo. <laughs> That's my first response. Um, I, I, I'm literally over this. I really believe that we as human beings are evolving and I think we are waking up to the manipulation of the industry on the common everyday people. Um, I really don't, you know, I I don't know Chelsea Handler um, from a can of spray paint. I really don't. Um, can I say that I have questions about her genuineness. Sure. I, I really do because um, I'm going to qualify my statements. Uh, a, a lot of times the people that are in the entertainment industry are the least educated people that you can imagine. Um, and so for me, someone who's highly educated, that has a graduate degree, that has multiple certifications in law and, uh, you know, uh, some other things that I'd rather not say because it would give away what I do today. Um, but I have questions. So one of the things that I did when I was an undergrad is that I was a commentary editor for my newspaper on campus. I also actually had a column. So social commentary is not something that is foreign to me. I've also been published and I've been published in a newspaper that has been circulated all through the United States. I also did an internship. So I'm not, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't want to sit up here and say that I'm, you know, someone that hasn't done certain things, but 
I needed to kind of sit down and I don't care if three people, only three people watch this video. I'm, I'm just doing some social commentary today from an African-American perspective on this particular Netflix video. And, and I'm gonna hit hard and I'm not, there's no hate in my heart for any, anybody. There's no um, anger, but I feel like the miseducation of the American Negro is an important book to read before you come for me. Another important book to read before you come to me um, is Savage Inequalities by a white Jewish man that I learned about in undergrad when he was challenging the public school system in the United States and how it is a breeding ground for race disparities and class disparities in the United States, okay? I think that I also need to qualify that when I first became a part of the executive class, my first management job was when I was 28 years old. Um, because I was the only African-American female, I was also put on the board to talk about diversity. I also want to mention that <laughs> I've actually conducted diversity trainings back in the 2000s um, when it was a big deal for um, people to talk about diversity, to hear about diversity, and to uh, share their thoughts on it. I went to a predominantly white institution. My, my husband got his undergrad from a historically black college and university. He did get his graduate degree from a predominantly white institution. However, it had a great deal of uh, non-white people that went to his campus. So I like to qualify when I speak only because when people are talking to me and they're talking to me about societal issues, I need to actually know a little bit about your background and your experience because I really need to know if you're someone who I, I feel like can understand what I'm talking about. Um, my, my grandparents come from the deep south. My grandparents come from segregation. They come from Jim Crow and so did my, my parents. And finally, before I get into it, when I was 11 years old, my stepfather, who actually has a Jewish last name, moved into a predominantly white Jewish community. The second, so I'm gonna have your, you guys that are listening do some research. I will give you a hint. So the, the blueprint for the suburban living is started by a person by the last name of Levitt. And the second suburban community that Levitt built is where my parents moved, my, my, my mother and stepfather moved. So when we moved into this area, we were probably one of three African-American families that moved into this white, but it was about 75% Jewish community. They actually did a movie. My, my husband found out about the movie because it was one of those ways that we intersect. The person that integrated the area that we moved into graduated from the same HBCU that he graduated from. And they had moved into the area because like a lot of African-American people wanted a better quality of life and they knew they weren't getting it living in a predominantly African American neighborhood. They didn't they didn't they didn't think that African American people could not have quality neighborhoods. It was because of the resources that they had when they lived in the African American neighborhood because the government did not want to fund these areas, businesses did not want to move into these areas. Excuse me, education did not want to invest in these areas because it was an African-American person. So if you have any questions about 
how African-American people are miseducated even today. I ask that you first read Savage Inequalities by Jonathan Kozel. I then will actually, I'm going to link the article that the Washington Post did not too long ago where it detailed that white communities receive $80 billion more in funding than predominantly African-American neighborhoods. And this is in, this is the United States in a public, public school system that everyone should have equal access to resources, education, and I'm going to get into that. So I just, I had to, I had to kind of spout that off. You forgive me, <sighs> but I didn't, I didn't, you know, I'm not a big fan of Chelsea uh, Handler. She ever comes across this. It's not personal, my dear. It's not personal. It's the truth because I've had so many race conversations with white people and Jewish people in my life that I no longer have those conversations. It's not because of hate, it's because I don't wanna get in an argument with someone. Here's what I focus on today. Today, I focus on educating and empowering my community. I'm not sitting at the table with white people or white and Jewish people asking for a piece of the pie. I'm at the place where I'm only here for education purposes. I'm here for African-American people to be empowered so that we don't have to go to any table and beg for anything. I want us to be able to be self-sufficient and be highly educated and be empowered within our own community so that we don't have to sit at a table and ask someone to give us a piece of bread. That's where I'm at. So when it comes to the conversation of white privilege, I learned this in college. I learned this in college. I had a professor. I did an independent study and I forget the professor's name, but I, I want to thank him so much. He was an Irish professor that was married to a Peruvian woman. Um, one, and he had wrote many books and he sat with me and I, I was, I was interviewing him for <laughs> for something that had to do with race relations. And he looked at me and he said, white people know exactly what it means to have white privilege. White people understand 100% what it means to live in the system of white supremacy. They act obtuse because they're just tolerating a conversation with you. Here's the thing. And again, this was a white person that was saying this to me. He said, why would a privileged class do anything to give up that privilege? What's, what, what, what's the motivation? So sure, I'll sit at a table and I'll have a conversation about diversity and I'll talk about how it's really unfair that you're, you're not getting everything that I'm getting. But do you honestly think that the majority of white people are going to give up their privilege? Why would they? What is the motivation? Of course, they're not going to um, give it up. And he went on to say, and this is why he said, I have a special distaste for white liberals most of all, because they are cowards. He was like, they'll do band-aids, like quotas and busing, but they won't do anything to actually fix the system so that everyone is on an equal playing field. And I had never literally had someone, especially someone white, that really broke it down for me like that. I don't, I don't literally need to know anything about white privilege. I'm an African American woman. My family has been in this country for five centuries. My family has been in this country longer than most white people have been in this country, but I still can go to places in the United States called sundown time, sun, sundown towns where 
Black people are openly told not to be in that area when the sun goes down. In 2019, so <laughs> for Jada Pinkett Smith to sit there in her red, red table talk on her lofty position of being a multimillionaire who goes between I'm African-American and I'm biracial. No, I didn't forget when you were sitting there with Jane Elliott and she asked you and your family if you were African-American or biracial and you said you were biracial. I was like, you know what? I hope people actually wake up and realize that a lot of times these celebrities are not, they don't care about the average African-American person and their experiences. They are on a different level and they are manipulating the public for their benefit. Let me tell you something. I gotta get real for a minute while my conditioner is sitting in my hair. The only people that I pay attention to that actually when they talk about the disparities based on race in the United States is people that are actually act doing actionable things that make me pay attention to they are really trying to change the fabric so that people have a fair and balanced playing field. So when Robert Johnson gave money to graduating seniors of Morehouse, that's when I, I pay attention to some money that's doing that. If you're not helping to change the system so that African-American people in my community have an equal chance, then I don't want to hear about no conversation White people are not going to give up their privilege. White Jewish women are not going to give up their privilege over a conversation. They know that they are privileged. They live in the United States. They know that they can, you know, <laughs> I, my, my, my husband was watching and we, we, we wound it to the beginning and jumped over some parts and there were some things that I really wanted to address specifically. So Chelsea Handler said, you know, I never really thought about being white and privileged. I never really thought about being white. Well, that's the actual privilege, my dear. See, from the time that I was born, I knew who I was. My parents trained me, but it was never, but I want to be clear about a few things. So I have to actually respond to something that Tiffany Haddish said in this, this documentary as well. Cause she said, you know, African-American people don't know who they are. We need to take a DNA test. We don't know who we are past a hundred years. Actually, that's not true. A lot of African-American people know their background. I know my background going centuries. I'm not walking around confused about my ancestry in this country. So I know who my grandparents were. I knew who my great-grandparents were. I know who my great-great-great-grandparents were. Um, that's nonsense. Most African-American people know their history and know their ancestry. We didn't just fall from the sky. What what happened is that we were illegally illegally brought here. And I don't I'm not going to go back and forth over how we got here because who was piloting those ships that came to the United States? They were not African people. So the ships that were brought to the Americas and the Caribbean were piloted by white people, okay? And when they brought us here, they enslaved us. We were not slaves when we were born. We were African people. What they took from us, because they wanted to break our spirit, they took from us where we came from in our ancestry in the West Africa's that we were taken from. That's it. I'm proud to be 
who I am because I know that in order for me to be sitting here doing this video, living in an upper class African American community, being at the top of my game means that no matter what white supremacy did to me, that my family is still here. And I have had family members that were lynched. My grandmother told me the first school that she went to, the Ku Klux Klan and the white townspeople over were so incensed that African Americans, they weren't called African Americans then, they were called colored and Negroes, wanted to go to school, that they burn their school to the ground. They literally burn their books. So I don't, I don't, I'm not, I'm not someone who just got off, you know, the boat. I don't, I'm not, I don't watch reality shows. I'm not caught up in love and hip hop and, and real housewives of all of that. I'm actually an intellect and I'm a researcher and I'm someone who actually cares about my community. And I refuse to let celebrities try to manipulate the American public and people all over the world with these BS. It's BS. <laughs> They're exploiting my community for clicks. When I, when my brother and I lived in a white Jewish community, let me explain to you all of the things that white Jewish people did to my African American family. The second week that my, 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 my mother and, and stepfather moved into this area. And what happened is they knew that these people may not have wanted African-American people to live in the community. So they, they hid behind my stepfather's last name, which is Jewish. My stepfather has a Jewish last name. He is, he's not, he's an African-American through and through. He went to HBCUs. Again, you can listen to my whole uh, three hour, uh, you know, oral traditional history on the African-American experience and my family background. And you will hear about my stepfather and his family who have taught at historically black colleges and universities have lived overseas in West Africa. So, they decided to have a buyer sort of do all of the legwork so the people that were in the community did not know that an African-American family was moving in until after we moved in. So the second week that we were there, excuse me, somebody spray painted um, get out nigs. The only reason that they didn't put the whole word on there is because there wasn't enough room. <laughs> um, but we, we came from the city, so we weren't flexing over that. Um, then about a month after that, my mother and I had went to the mall in the area and someone had killed a possum and they had thrown it on the car. And I remember when my mom and I walked to the the car and it was there. But having gone to school there a few years, um, which I did not stay, I went back to graduate at the top of my class at a predominantly African-American high school. But um, my, my education has been all over. By the time I graduated, I had, I graduated with like 12 more credits than I needed. Um, but I learned some things about living around white and Jewish people. Um, they were extremely racist. They were extremely patronizing. Um, they made it very clear that it was an us and them. Um, a lot of times when I interacted with the kids, they were very stereotypical. But I think the one thing that was most interesting was how ignorant these people were about African-American people. The stereotypes that they have about African-American people is absolutely outrageous. And I, when I went to college, it did not change. I actually had people arguing with me about, you know, majority of African-Americans 
on welfare, which is a lie. Um, my teacher, who I had had before, the one who had, I did an um, independent study, was actually my teacher for the sociology uh, class that I took. And they were talking about affirmative action, which actually came up in the Chelsea Handler video when she was sitting down and she was talking to the what I consider to be the average Af uh, the the average white person white female in the United States when you talk about how do you feel about you having privilege how do you feel as it relates to African American people and again it's like <laughs> I, I feel that that. The whole thing was more of a pat on the back. We white, we privileged. I mean, what is the point of this conversation? It, 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 to make you feel good? We know you're white and you're privileged. Um, are you going to sit there and, 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 and act like I shouldn't have this privilege? Get out of here with this stuff. Like, really, it's it's insulting. It's insulting to educated African Americans. It's insulting to African Americans that are, may not be traditionally educated, but are very wise to the to the ways that the system of white supremacy work. And here's what these people said. Um, I don't feel like I'm privileged over African Americans. I mean. They have quotas. Listen, I'm an African-American. I don't believe in quotas, but if we're going to talk about quotas, let's talk about it because I'm actually an educated African-American woman. I'm actually someone who's published things on a research level, not somebody that stood in front of an audience and had some crash jokes that I could get paid for because I happen to be a white female and Jewish. And therefore, I'm, I'm a millionaire instead of somebody that should be uh, sweeping up uh, stuff in the back of a, of a, of a, you know, run down supermarket. Um, <laughs> that's your privilege to be mediocre and still get paid and recognition for it. That's white privilege. Um, you know, if you want to be real about it, but getting back to this woman is talking about how is it fair that there's a quota? Well, let's be clear about that. The greatest beneficiaries of quotas and affirmative action have been white women. So if you want to criticize that a company has to fulfill certain quotas and make sure that it is diverse so that white women have a chance against the white male establishment. And if you want to talk about that, I've already I studied feminism, second sex. Simone de Barze, or how you pronounce her name. So I can talk about that because I've taken courses on it and I have talked about it. So let's be clear. White women benefited from quotas. So if you're going to challenge quotas and you're going to challenge how it is not fair that a company tries to do something to fight against a system, a systematic practice a foundation that is in place to keep certain groups of people out. Let's start with the quotas that they have for white women. And see, that's the thing. You can't pick and choose what you're going to get pissed off about, especially when it's all coming from the same place. So let me, let me, let me just kind of keep it real. This is not going to be this long video. <sighs> I've had debates, you know, I've had debates. Um, one of the second year that I was at my university, they actually had something called intellectual heritage. And um, what they do is they, they try and choose these, these great um, topics for all people that are going to get their, their bachelor's and their, their graduate degree at this university that you actually have to talk about these things. So the, the time that I was at my university, which is a top university in the United States, we talked about race, class, and gender. That was, and I still have my, I still have my books here. And I actually, again, this is kind of why I had a little bit more knowledge about how white people think because they were forced to come out of those safe positions of not talking about it. Um, they were forced to talk about it. We had these, uh, um, 
we had a, a we would go to a a meeting where we would have a speaker that would go over what the subject was for that week and then we had another sort of smaller group of all the people that were in this one group and we would have to discuss it in this group where it was called a resuscitation and we had to sort of re talk about it in depth we had to do some research papers on it and i never forget because it was a sort of um, a white a mixed race Brazilian was in charge of the group that I was a part of. Most of the people that were in the class were, I'm, I'm going to say that 45 of the people that were in the, my class were white and the rest were African American or Hispanic. And I, I could tell, listen, I know for a fact white people don't want to talk about race. They hate talking about race because they feel like they're going to be attacked. Um, we learned about it from the beginnings of, you know, social Darwinism. We learned about it from Brown versus education. We, we learned about it from, you know, Ferguson. And we learned about it from uh, the 14th Amendment, which was addressing a, a, in a Supreme Court case that had taken away citizenship from African American people. You know, we talked about it from, you know, not just what your family told you to make you feel good so that you don't have to address something that you can live in your lily white community and not deal with on a day to day basis, but how other people outside of your community and that actually are just as much a, a part of the United States lives. See, because we, we intersect. That's why I like that movie Crash. Unless you live in like Wyoming or someplace like that, um, which is all Native American territory, and I've already talked about my Native American background in Alabama, um, but the, the Native American background that, that is a part of my family is not something to be celebrated because the Cherokees did not want to even acknowledge the African American people that were a part of the Cherokee Nation. And that is, I have one ancestor that was Cherokee. And we had to actually go for the government and get land that my family has. So I literally, my, my family um, has as much right to this country as anybody. We have been here since the beginning and, and some of my uh, family tree. Also, my family, all of my family, including my husband, have fought in the military. My, my one grandfather is in the history books. Um, so it's Army and Navy. So when people start talking about you, you don't deserve to be here or you don't deserve to talk about your your family, or they want to use a percentage, which has been, uh, you know, you're only 12%, you're only 13%. Listen, it's more like 20%. Um, the, the, the qualifications and classifications of race have been convoluted. <laughs> Let's just be clear. So we're here, we've been here, and we have just as much of right to talk about our experiences and disparity, discrimination, and the system that has tried to keep us down. And that was really why I wanted to have a conversation about the Chelsea Handler um, Netflix special called White Privilege. I feel like it's a snub to true people that are going through the struggle and have lived the struggle. I think that the real people that needed to be a part of that conversation are never going to be a part of that conversation. And who do I mean by that? I mean that the people that actually make the laws, the people that actually are in power to change things. I mean, read, watch, look up Jane Elliott where she says all white people are racist. This is Jane Elliott. She is considered the the foremaster of talking about race. I actually saw her in person at a special presentation. This is real talk. 
This is about the lives of people. If you're not willing to address a system, a system that guarantees that there will be people at the faces of the bottom of the well, Derek Bell, if you're going to do the research and talk about it, you need to actually talk about it. I don't want to hear celebrities talking about something that really doesn't affect them. Jada Pinkett Smith, what is, how does that affect the Smiths? What's going on with, with over 35 million African-American people? I mean, if anything, I would expect Will Smith to go to Overbrook High School in West Philadelphia and Jada Pickett to go to the high school that she lived in in Baltimore. And, and it should be the top schools in their cities that they came from. If you're really, really, truly caring about the systematic situation that goes on with African-American people, and you're not just using your celebrity to exploit a subject. So let's talk about the Little Rock Nine. <laughs> when the governor was doing every, the governor in the, the people that lived in the town were doing everything they could to stop African-American people from going to school with white people. See, that's systemic. There have been a lot of actually white people, not a lot, but there have always been white people that have been really honest about the truth of this country. And they know that the truth of the matter is it is set up for them to win. And why would winners ever want to give up that trophy so that other people can sit on the podium with them? So that's how I feel about, you know, white people like, well, what do you mean that, that, that they, they want what I want? You know, and, and, and the, the commentary that's not being said is, are you stupid? Do you really think I'm going to give up my privilege? I'm going to be as obtuse. And I'm going to like, you know, play straw man and, and talk over things so that I never have to be caught on the carpet for the climate that I live in. I, the same teacher, the same sociological, uh, sociological teacher that I had, soci sociology teacher that I had, um, he said, if you really want to see how racist white people are, talk about the education in the United States and see how they respond. So this is kind of where I'm, I'm going to I'm going to end it because I really, you know, when people say, what do you mean by systemic? Systemic. It's not about a celebrity getting around a table and going to spoken word with a group of African-American people. And, you know, we're like, why are we here? We, we know, and I've done spoken word. Okay. I, I know I don't need, you know, so you can paint us as angry and aggressive and you can use the stereotypes that we're lazy and that we don't know our fathers and da, da, da. no, I'm married. None of the children we have were born outside of marriage. My parents were married before they actually had my brothers and I, <laughs> my father has a master's degree. He's not the greatest man. If you want to read, you know, listen to any of my other videos about being an ex Jehovah witness as a whole subculture in the African American community. But let me tell you, my parents are married. Somebody in my family was on welfare. My father has a graduate degree. My husband has a graduate degree. I have a graduate degree. It doesn't mean that there aren't places in the United States that we still can go as of today. As African American people, but getting back to the systemic, the system of white supremacy, which none of these celebrities will touch. And my, my professor, my soci, my sociologist, why do I keep messing up this word? My soci, my sociological teacher, soci. You know, you ever have like a brain? I don't know why my brain is just not wanting to say this word, sociologic. I don't know why it doesn't want to say it. But anyway, my teacher that talked about social issues. <laughs> and I'm only doing one take, so any flubs, flurb, ignore them. My teacher, when we were talking about social issues, said the, a very important thing 
um, about how you know that white people are actually racist is how they react, react to education and property value and how they will make sure that their children have the best education and how property values are actually attached to the education in their community. But then the funding for education is based on the property values of neighborhoods. So this is inherently racist because what happens is that the teachers and the students are only going to be getting the best education if they are funded well. White parents go out of their way to make sure that they live in areas where they are getting the best funding for their schools which is an inherently racist system. When you have property values that are based on education, which are different. See, I personally think this whole property value and then funding the school based on property value is a setup. One of the things I wanna do before I die is go to places like Mississippi and Louisiana where the, cause I can understand there being dis disparities in a private school system. In a private school system, I I'm cool because the parents are paying out of their pocket for their kids to have the best education. But in a public education system, where I don't know anybody in my entire family that has not paid taxes. We, we that my family has worked for free for centuries. So we worked for free for centuries, helped build this country. We were overly taxed as poor people, yet we never saw the benefit of being overly taxed in our education. We were still miseducated. Uh, you know, why, why were white people so angry to have black people going to a school with them. Why did white townspeople burn down my grandparents' school and burn their books? Because they were in they were furious that black people were getting educated. Because when you are miseducated and uneducated, you are easier to exploit and you are easier to use so that you can have what you have. Learn what capitalism is really all about. You have to have an underclass to exploit in order for there to be a ruling class. And I don't see no celebrity giving up that privilege. And I don't see no white Jewish Chelsea Handler doing anything actionable. Uh, does she go into Congress? Is she going, I mean, using her celebrity status to change the fabric of the United States so that every child that is a part of a public school system gets the same education regardless of race, class, and, and, and you know, social and economic status? We, we look at the world, we look at India and caste systems and things like that. We have a caste system right here in the United States. We have a caste system right in the United States, even in upper class African-American communities. And you can go to the Washington Post and you can go to the New York Times and you can see these articles where they are overwhelmingly undervalued because not for no other reason than because people are African-American, they are safe. They are well, I, I can show you the articles on on the, the upper class African American communities that are in the United States, but they are that they are grossly undervalued in the same the same homes, the same the same structures. If it's a white person living there, it's a three hundred thousand dollar inflated uh you know uh, uh property value on it simply because it's white people living there. And then they use that value to fund the school system. So of course the school system is going to be better.
redlining. But it starts with education. And that was my point. Do, do, these, uh, do these celebrities really care? Oh, you have a black friend. So you were motivated because you had a little bit of white guilt and you're doing this liberal video and you think that that's actually really gonna change anything. People aren't giving up that white privilege. That's my reaction. That's my reaction to Chelsea Handler's video. How dare you insult us with this nonsense. And, and to Jada Pickett's Red Table Talk, I, I, I really want to hear from educated people that are actually walking the walk and doing what they're doing. You know, we need less educators and more. We need less celebrities and entertainers and more educators and people that are actually going out and fighting this system so that people can have equal access to education. Uh, see, I, my stepfather was an educator. My husband is an educator. And yes, I do believe that parents need to get involved. I do. My parents were involved. My parents knew my teachers. My parents, I had, before I could turn on the television, my schoolwork had to be done. But that does not absolve the responsibility of this country to be fair in a public school system. Why is it that there's places in Mississippi where it's a it's a it's a it's a school to, it's a prison pipeline. You you give these people nothing. They're going to school with terrible infrastructure, teachers that are not getting paid anything. And again, 80 billion are you serious an 80 billion dollar discrepancy? And I am going to link that article based on race in the United States. What is busing going to do? What if you can't get bus? That's a band-aid. You're not really trying to fix the system. You're not really trying to give up your privilege. You're privileged enough so that you don't have to think about race until somebody calls it up to you and you still get annoyed when people do it. I want to finally um, make a statement that uh, my, my, my journalism mentor, uh, we, we had a conversation at one time. Um, when I became commentary editor at my university, a lot of people did not want an African-American female to be the commentary editor at my university. They actively tried to stop me from being a commentary editor. And my advisor actually had to get involved. So I actually did become the commentary editor and I did a lot of great things for diversity. Um, did, had a lot of articles about people from all different walks of life. Um, people that I felt were being pushed and marginalized I really wanted to, it wasn't just about being African-American, it was about being gay, it was about being Muslim, it was about being people that they wouldn't um, wouldn't get uniquely heard. And it's nothing about Jewish people. I'm actually a part of a of an interfaith community. <clears throat> and I have actually gone to interfaith community discussions um, where I've gone to a synagogue and I've gone to a mosque and I've gone and had honest conversations about us finding a commonality instead of fighting against each other. But in order for us to find a commonality, we actually need to have honest conversations about what's going on in our communities and stop tap tiptoeing around the truth. The truth of the matter is that being an African-American female is a negative in this society. We are marginalized, we are silenced, um, we are pushed in corners. Everyone wants to talk about every other community than what is going on with African-American women and African-American families and children. And I, am, I don't want to hear someone else talking about something unless they're trying to do something to change the system, an actionable item. I don't, we've been, we have been talking and marching and writing about racist, inequalities in this country for over a century. 
my family has been in this country for over 500 years. We know everything there is to know about what white people think about us. We know. <laughs> so that's why I don't have conversations with race. Not really. I'm here to empower my community to be better and to do better and to be self-sufficient and to get our education and to work hard for everything. But what I won't do is I won't sit back and have somebody mock my, my struggle or mock my intelligence or mock my community. But I wanted to end with a conversation I had with my um, journalism mentor. Uh, I, I still have a lot of a lot of good 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 things to say. He was my he mentored me. Um, he helped me to be a great journalist and he helped me to be a great writer. Um, but we were having a conversation after all of this stuff had happened, and I actually did become the commentary editor. And um, you know. He he was I think he was coming from the white male perspective and his wife was Jewish. So he said, you know, I, I, I know, you know, him and I, we had never talked about race before, but we had a conversation then and he was like, you know, I, I, I understand your position. He's like, but you have to understand um, white people don't want to talk about race. We don't want to talk about race. We don't want to talk about race with it. With African American people, we want to live our lives. We want to go in our picket fence houses. We want to eat our meals with our kids. We want to, you know, we want to go on vacation. We don't want to talk about race. We don't. <clears throat> and then I said to him, "Well, why is it that we're always talking about the Holocaust, and we're always talking about, you know, what the Nazis did?" Um, and all that stuff happened in Germany, but we don't want to talk about 500 years and 400 years of systemic discrimination, marginalization, and racism in the United States. And he was like, that's the past though. I'm like, but it's really not. Jim Crow, segregation are things that happened to my family, to my parents. There's people that are actually still here. And I talked about um, something that I had just learned about in one of my classes where, you know, in Northern Virginia, when they, when they defer, diversify schools, in Northern Virginia, they actually close the schools down. And I actually have a friend, I have a friend who is married to someone who taught in what they call basement schools. So when you hear African-Americans talking about reparations, there are things that, that, that have happened about reparations because all of the black students that missed out on about a year of school because white people, so this was a walkout. So what happened is after Brown versus education, there was you know governors and, and the government that was forcing white schools to diversify. But counties and cities um, and areas where white people were refusing to do it, especially in the South. In Northern Virginia, when they were forced to allow African-American people to go to school, they shut down their schools. So it wasn't just the parents that pulled their kids out. The white teachers refused to allow African-American students into their classrooms. Now, this wasn't like 100 years ago. There are, there, the people that are getting reparations have gotten them and are using them to go to college now and to take other to take you know training or whatever. They're still alive. And they're not like old, old people. So, you know, for people to be like, oh my God, it was so long ago. No, it wasn't. And if you had that as a foundation, what do you think their children are going through? What do you think these people that are still working when they lived in a time when they were refusing to allow their children or the children were being told you can't go to school with the N-words? These people are still here. And what if they still believe it? I mean, if they're still sun downtowns, if they're still places in the United States and Texas and Florida where they don't, they openly don't want African Americans to live and even go into, and you better not be caught there after dark. Uh, you know, let's be real about the climate that's going on today. So I was, you know, I was telling him, I was telling my teacher all that kind of stuff. And for for once, he was like. 
You have a point. But what can you do? Sometimes you just have to accept what you what you can fix and, and kind of, you know, go on with your life. So African Americans are sort of told we need to be passive in a in a way and, and stop rocking the boat because we're angry and we're bitter. I'm not angry or bitter. I'm actually very happy. I'm actually very proud <clears throat> of who I am because I've actually figured it out. I figured out the way to fight the system, and that is to be empowered in your own community, to be collectively empowered. So you can create your own businesses and create your community so that you can have a force where you don't have to force, you, you don't have to ask for acceptance. You're going to take it regardless. Because <clears throat> people are not going to give up their privilege on their own. They're just not. Sitting around talking about it, no matter how forlorn, oh my God, I feel so terrible that I'm privileged. You're not giving it up. You know, you can kind of stop doing that because we're not stupid. We get it. We know that this is more of a pat on the back, wink, wink. I have black friends. I'm so sad that you got to go through that. You know, stop, 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 stop. <laughs> you, you're not going to get my attention. You're not going to get my attention unless you're actually doing something actively. And I challenge every celebrity that ever comes across this video. If you are in a, in, in a, in a community, if you're African-American, Jay-Z, Beyonce, Will Smith, Jada Pinkett Smith, listen, if you are not actively trying to change the education system in this country so that African-American children can have a good education regardless of the class and status of their parents, I don't want to hear a thing you're saying. If you are not giving money to historically black colleges and universities so that kids can go to college and not have to worry about student loans, I don't want to hear anything you're saying. Because you're just, you're playing games with us. And the, the time is up. <laughs> the time is up. So I said I wasn't going to take too too long. I appreciate everyone that listened to me. Um, I will be back to my regular XJW commentary. Uh, but stay, stay blessed. Stay blessed. And remember that. Every single person in here, every single person has the capacity to change the world. Thank you.